All right. We have a uh, great show today. Got my good friend here, Mr. Justin Donnell, a lifestyle investor. Justin, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jeff. Glad to be here. I don't know if you remember or not, but last summer I had my son at quarterback camp. Manning Passing Academy in South Louisiana, and I text you about uh, a podcast interview you had done with, I believe his name is Khalil Rafati. Yes. And I said, man, that was one of the most powerful. I even got my son to listen to it on the way back, and I thought he was asleep in the back of the truck. I got out to get gas, and I turned the car off. Well, the, the podcast went off, and he sat up. He's like, Dad, I was listening to that. I mean, for a 16 year old to say that. So uh, his story and his book, I forgot to die was, was fantastic. So um, I don't know where you get these people on your podcast, but man, the lifestyle investor podcast is one of my favorite ones. So thank you for that. Well, so thank you, Jeff. I, I really appreciate that. And Khalil has become a great friend and he's reinvented himself. He's doing amazing things for people. He's got incredible food uh, through his restaurant, Sun Life Organics, and true down and out, worst case scenario. I mean, every time you think life can't get worse, it got worse. I yeah. mean, like 10 times you thought it couldn't get worse and it got worse. The guy is just an unbelievable person. And uh, I feel blessed to have him and, and many others like him, you know, in my, uh, in my network and in my, in my peer group. Well, I don't remember who it is, who it was that introduced me to you, but it was, it was all about, you've got to read this book and, it, and, the, and the title just really caught my eye, Lifestyle Investor. So for those out there that don't really know what that term means, what is a uh, lifestyle investor? Yeah, Jeff, I came up with the term because I wanted to kind of differentiate what uh, my goal was, what I do as compared to maybe other investors or um, other people in the investment space. And really for me, it's that I wanted to own my time. So as a lifestyle investor, lifestyle is first. And so it's buying assets that produce income to allow me to live the lifestyle that I really desire for myself and for my family uh, and, and really to kind of break free of, of the, the chains or the handcuffs that shackle most people to whatever it is. I mean, some people are shackled to their job. Some people, they've got the handcuffs on, you know, maybe their own business, their own private practice, or, or some people it's just like having some sort of handcuff to like certainty or safety or a routine, the, all, all the, the known uh, and not being you know, in this unknown realm, right? And so I think for most people, it's hard to do different than what they've been doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's my goal. It's to buy my time back. It's to spend it the way I want to spend it. So I'm using my gifts in a way that fill me up, that fill others up, that I'm spending time with the people that matter the most. And it's not that I'm not working. I'd go crazy not working. <laughs> but it's that I'm working on the projects that really give me energy and for the time frame, you know? So right. if I want to work, you know, 10 hours one week and 40 hours another week or no hours for three weeks in a row, I can do that. And I feel like that to me is ultimate freedom. Yeah. And as a periodontist, you know, I associate with a lot of other dentists and physicians and attorneys. We, that, that's just not our thinking at all. It's, we can't say, you know, I could just work two hours. I can only work two hours and still get paid or whatever. So that's, uh, that's a different way of thinking for sure. Um, it seems to me like whenever I hear these really ultra wealthy people, how they got started, you know, the, the Mark Cubans and, you know, people like that, it seems like they always started in sales, selling stuff. And, you know, I, I know about your story with the Cutco knives a little bit. And, um, cause I, you know, as a deer hunter, I've got all kinds of I've got them all. I've got all the kitchen knives, you name it. How did you even think about getting that job? And then maybe you're learning it, what you learned from it that, that helped you take the next step. Yeah, Jeff, that's a great question. And, you know, for me, the, well, first of all, the way I got the job was I was looking to earn more money to pay for college. And so this was right before my uh, freshman year of college. I had just graduated high school. Uh, I knew that my parents couldn't afford to send me to college. 
and I had to find a way to do it. And so this opportunity for me made sense because I was paid based on performance and based on, you know, work ethic as opposed to just some set hourly range. Um, and for me, that was a big, uh, big mover because previously, you know, I had a job where I was selling newspaper subscriptions door to door when I was, I started doing that in seventh grade. And uh, I ended up, I was horrible at first, but I ended up getting pretty good at that job. Um, and so I was earning income in accordance to my performance. And so I knew that I liked that. I knew that that was good for me and that I could outperform others because my work ethic, I could become like obsessive, I guess, with being the best I could be that I, I know that I could outperform others because my work ethic would trump what most people would work. So having a job like Cutco is great because it was the same thing. The harder I worked, the more I was paid. And that's how I paid for my tuition at the University of Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, paid for all my, you know, four years there by selling Cutco and uh, ended up becoming a manager with them and uh, kind of moved up the ranks and built a lot of the, the training and, uh, you know, kind of sales programs that they use um, today based on, you know, just time spent and things I learned and mentors that I had and trial and error. Yeah. And I've got two teenagers and I'm always stressing to them about, about guys, if you learn how to sell and you learn about marketing and customer service, it doesn't matter what you do, you're going to excel in life. So would you agree with that? Oh, without a doubt. And what it does, so it's it's not even necessarily that I had sales skills, though I think that's important. Mm -hmm. Because before I actually had the sales skills, I learned how to handle rejection. And I learned how to have persistence. And those two uh, attributes are what gave me the time to be able to learn how to get good at sales. Mm. And so I think that um, I just kind of got numb to people saying no. I, at first, I took it real personal, like, oh, man, do they not like me? <laughs> you know, what did I do wrong? Right. Uh, and later, it was like, oh, no, they're just saying no to the only thing I've suggested at this point so far. You know, maybe this exact, you know, deal uh, or this exact product or set or group of items doesn't match the price point that they have, or maybe it's too many or it's too few. So it gave me this ability to, you know, transcend the no's, the lack of success to get to the point where I could actually become good, learn scripts, memorize things, learn how to handle objections that people gave me. And then it just gave me confidence in working with people. So, I mean, the soft skills that you get in sales, uh, that, that's the game changer. I, I mean, technical sales skills are great. But I think the soft skills of building rapport and learning how to speak with people any age, learning how to actually present things like that to me is so much more valuable than the technical sales skills of, hey, this close and then drop down and handle this objection. Um, but I think that's pretty relevant too. Yeah, because when, when we're in dental school and even in medical school, most of the patients that come in, they either they get free treatment or they don't really pay that much. So I'm always like, would just say, Hey, you know, Justin, you need this tooth out. You need this implant. You need this bone grafting. Okay. Then they go schedule while well, I got to private practice, same thing. Hey, you need this, 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 and this, they go up front and see the bill and they'd walk out the door. And after a few months, I'm like, I'm going to go broke if I don't learn something, you know, so that's why I'm really stressing with them, my kids, you know, start, start with that. So, um, so, okay, you did that. So then where, where after that, so you, you probably got a little taste of passive income. So what do you remember what maybe your first passive income stream was at that point? Yeah. Yeah. So Jeff, what ended up happening is I worked really hard and I was rewarded for that hard work. And the harder I worked, the more I would make. And so I got into this cycle of just put in even more hours and I can make more money. And um, that I think served me until it didn't serve me, right? So there's a period of life where you maybe don't have as many other commitments. And so for me, I could work really hard. This was before having a family, but I knew when I had a family, I didn't want to sacrifice my time with them. I didn't want to sacrifice my time, you know, with my spouse, my, you know, today, my wife, but back then I was single 
you know, working hard, but recognizing that the way I was working today isn't how it was going to be in three or five or 10 years, um, that it wasn't sustainable. And it was more like a startup. And I know, you know, you and many other doctors that have done the whole private practice uh, route, you know, this world of startup and what it's like working a business when you don't have a team and you are the team and, you know, everything falls on you and it's crazy hours. But um, to continue doing that and to not build the infrastructure to me was crazy. And then on top of it, it got to a point where even just the time with the infrastructure of other people became more than I wanted to do. And I just realized that uh, instead of having my time produce income, I could have assets that produce income, or I could have my capital that I've saved produce income. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I started investing first in mobile home parks. So my first piece uh, of cassive, uh, passive cash flow came from a mobile home park that I bought that when I was looking at the numbers, I realized buying this park could replace my wife's income. She was a teacher at the time mm -hmm. and her, flex, her, her schedule wasn't very flexible. Uh, in the summers, it was great, but that was my busiest season at, at where you know, I was working at that time. And so- um, so did somebody introduce that type, type of investing to you? How did you just think about mobile home park? Well, it's kind of funny. Um, I was looking to start a real estate company with some friends. We were looking at uh, single family homes mm. and I had been looking at some apartment complexes, technically like three and four flats when I lived in Chicago. Okay. But at that point in time, I didn't understand how easy it was to, to get money. So I didn't have money mm -hmm. and I'd find these deals, but I felt like, how am I ever going to be able to do these deals? I don't have the money. I mean, today it's so much different because I recognize if you have a good deal, just let people know about it. And if it really is a good deal, you'll find the money. The money is yeah. the easiest part about it mm -hmm. because there's always people trying to get a good return. They've got money. They need to put it to work, but I didn't get that then. And so I ended up steering towards single family homes, but one of my buddies is like, Hey, I'm going to start buying mobile home parks and I'm going to sell my single family homes because I think it's a better model. Uh, and so He's like, I'm going to go to a boot camp. You want to come with me? And I said, no, that sounds horrible. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know what you're talking about, but if it is good, I'll know in time, I'll watch you and I'll recognize that it's good. And I, I just thought it wasn't going to be any good. I thought like, how could this be a good investment? And why does my friend want to do this? He's going in a totally different direction than what we had talked about, but it turned out to work really well for him. And um, I just saw the success he was having. He was working less. He had more income. And there's just so much, um, there's so much less management and you're getting so many units in one fail swoop. It just made a lot of sense with mm -hmm. single family homes. You're picking them off one at a time right. and you have to have a lot of capital. So uh, I watched him take off and I was like, you know what? I can do this. I'm just going to copy him. And so that's what I did. You know, I learned how to do it. Um, just kind of mentored uh, by, well, really what it was, I was a copycat. I found the best people that were doing it and I just used their playbook and it went really well. And so that first park that I bought, my wife was able to retire and uh, eventually she became, you know, a stay at home mom. And we bought another park that covered our uh, survival income, basically just what it cost us just to survive, not the lifestyle, um, just to cover the bills, cover the mortgage, cover the utilities, cover food. Um, and, and that was just a, a huge weight off of my shoulders to know that I didn't have to work. I instead got to work. I had the privilege of working, but now it was on my terms. And that was the first time in my life that it had been on my terms that all bills were covered. And if I go to work, it's because I choose to go to work. That's awesome. So you, you, you did the cut co you did the mobile home park. So tell us what were maybe some of the other, um, your, your kind of your next investments that you started doing after that. Yeah. Well, I'm technically, I bought a few more mobile home parks because I wanted to get to our lifestyle income. And then I wanted to get above the lifestyle income and have some surplus. And, and so when you while, say lifestyle income, that's basically would, would basically support your lifestyle, whether you're there or not. That's right. That's okay. right. So my goal is how do I just have the lifestyle that I have totally uninterrupted? I don't have to work. If I work okay. great, if I don't great, 
I just didn't want the pressure of working a lot of hours. I just wanted to be able to work when I wanted to and not work when I didn't want to. It's not that I didn't like what I was doing. It's that I didn't like how much I was doing the thing that I was doing. Okay. And I wanted it to be more flexible. And so that to me was the key is like, now I can live life how I want. Technically, we have more money coming in than what it costs us to live. So I need to figure out where to put that money. And uh, I started going down the, the route of starting another business and quickly realized that uh, that was a trap. I was going into a whole lot more work. And so I pivoted and kind of switched more into an equity role mm -hmm. um, just as an investor, not as an operator. And from there, I started investing in several other things. I'd find companies that um, either made sense to buy a portion of or to fully buy. And then I would put operators in to run them or bring on equity partners that could run them. Mm -hmm. um, so I did that with, with several companies. Um, I found ways to utilize senior secured debt for cash flow. So basically I would kind of be in the first position, a senior lien position on an asset worth more than the amount of money that I was lending or investing uh, into a certain you know, asset or to a certain person. So if anything went wrong, I could take that asset. Maybe it's worth twice or three times as much as the dollars I'm putting in this deal. So there's a lot of incentive to them for it to not go wrong, for you know, right. me to get the payments that um, the contract says. And so that was a real fun you know, experience. And so I think there's a lot in that. And by the way, I just got into more real estate too. I mean, I've done every type of real estate that you can think of, unless it's super obscure. And I still like cash flowing real estate the best uh, of, of real estate. But I think with the right type of operating companies, with the right operators, you can do some amazing things. And some of these companies, you can buy them and there's already a salary built in for the operator. So it's, uh, it's not hard based on the income it's already producing to run something profitable that doesn't take much time or totally replaces your income and you then have the time to, I don't know, do five hours a week on it. So you, are you actively sourcing these deals? Like, like people ask me, Jeff, how do you find the real estate deals? Well, for me, with having the blog and YouTube channel, there's always people coming to me, you know, with deals or this or that. So is that kind of your position? Or are you actively looking for these types of deals as well? Yeah, so it's both. So I'm for sure always looking for these types of deals. I've got a lot that come to me. Um, you know, I've been investing for about 22 years. I've been in more of the alternative investment space for about 15 years. Okay. Uh, and so I just have a lot of relationships now at this point, Jeff, where people come to me. I've, I've, um, I've got a lot of people that give me first dibs because um, they know that, you know, I've got a good, you know, we've got a good history that I'm going to treat them right. And uh, I do a lot of passive investing too. So a lot of the deals I do require no time. It's a true passive yeah. investment where just my dollars are working, my time's not working. And so that's like one of the things, you know, even inside my mastermind, the Lifestyle Investor Mastermind, where um, we're vetting deals together as a group and we're investing in a bunch of different things across the board. It could be, you know, music royalties, all the way to operating companies, to everything in between. So how important, in your opinion, how important is it for somebody that's listening to this or watching this, that they're out there, they're a, they're a dentist or a physician, they're an engineer, they're whatever, they're in a position where they just now realize, hey, I'm trading my time for dollars. That's it. You know, if, if daddy doesn't go to work, mama doesn't get paid, you know, and that was my wake up call when I injured my wrist snow skiing. It's like, you never think about getting hurt or getting sick until you get hurt or sick. So somebody that their being at the job depends on the income. How important is, is it for that person to start building passive income in your opinion? Well, I think it's incredibly important. I mean, this is, it's like an insurance policy. If anything goes wrong, if uh, your, you know, your, your trade, your craft, your, um, specialization becomes, um, you know, maybe less in demand, or there's more uh, options, there's more competition, uh, healthcare changes. I mean, there, there's just so many things that could disrupt 
and we've already seen it a little bit, but it could disrupt the the medical industry. I mean, so we, I we think couldn't, we couldn't practice for two two months in yeah. uh, 2020. You know, I got exactly. a, I got a letter from the state board of dentistry on a Tuesday, and it said by Thursday you will not be able to see any more patients until we tell you. That's scary, man. That's real scary. That's and scary, and that's a scary position if you only got one stream of income coming in. That's right. Yeah, and and it's based on and by the way, so now there are controls in place that are out of your control, right? But then there's also the health side of it, you know, as a dentist or, you know, many professions where it takes a toll on your back, it takes a toll on, you know, you know, other parts of your body or other things that, you know, one, one mistake that you make or one accident that happens and you could be totally wiped out. But I think even more so than that, Jeff, just having the income so people can choose to work 20 hours a week, instead of 40, 50 or 60 hours a week, just to have it for that reason. If nothing ever goes wrong, you never lose your business or anything like that. I mean, just to be able to choose how much you work, I think is important. I know a lot of people that are burned out from their profession and they think that they're burned out from their profession. What it is, is that they're burned out with how much time they're spending. If you could cut it in half, they'd actually probably like what they do and keep yeah. doing it for a long time. That's, that's really helped me a lot with my practice. It, it, that's what it was. I wasn't taking enough time with the kids and traveling. And so now we, you know, we, we do more traveling and I'll tell you what, with teenagers, it's like in the blink of an eye, they're gone, man. Yeah. When they can start driving. It's almost like they don't live with you anymore. You know, they're, they're always with their friends and stuff, but yeah, you're right. You know, you only got so much time with your kids to enjoy those special moments and all that. And then after that, so yeah, you know, not burning out, not working all that. So I, I agree with you totally. So I guess the, the million dollar question, and it's, it's right behind your head. What, so, so how does somebody actually become a lifestyle investor? Well, you know, it's, it's easy to, you know, simply, I mean, I'll put it this way. You can read a book mm -hmm. and I've got a book, obviously the lifestyle investor. Um, some people take action on it. Some people don't. To me, the easiest thing to do is to find someone or something that you can take action on or with like, that's mm -hmm. it. Yeah. I mean, I, my goal was to provide financial education because I want to help people buy their time back and stop trading time for money. It is by the way, the highest taxed money, your earned income is taxed at the highest rate. Mm -hmm. Passive income is taxed at the lowest rate. So it's, uh, you know, it, it's the easiest work with the least amount of taxes. And you could actually become a passive investor from a tax standpoint where you owe even less taxes. Uh, you know, it's, so you really, so it's, you really it's don't need to replace your active income, right? Because if you just have passive income, that's tax less, like you said. Yeah. And the other thing is um, when people have their income, to cover their expenses. So if your passive income covers your expenses, mm -hmm. at that point in time, there's just so much space to think, to create, mm -hmm. to um, figure out what you wanna do. I mean, I've seen professionals, even in your industry that shift from actively working to bringing in you know, other doctors to truly run the practice or bring in a, you know, a COO or to um, transition into consulting. So instead of running it, just helping other doctors. I mean, there's so many other ways uh, where you can do it. But, you know, I think my book is a great resource. You know, all the proceeds from my book go to uh, a charity called Love Justice International, which uh, helps save children and others that are being, you know, victimized through human trafficking and, and sex slaving. And so, um, you know, awesome. for anyone... Yeah, for anyone that does uh, end up getting it, just know that it's going to a good cause. I wanted the content to go towards financial freedom, but I wanted the dollars to go towards human life freedom. Uh, and so, you know, there's, I give actually 12 examples of, of investments that I did and I draw out everything, you know, the exact terms, the way I negotiated it, the structure, everything's there so people can copycat it. And then if people want more or they want to be part of our, you know, network, our mastermind, take any of our, our master classes, they can do that as well. That's, that's what, one of the things that really impressed me when I read the book, because you, you don't, you know, you just think about how you invest in, in something, but man, the different terms that you get on the, on the front end, on the back end, if something doesn't work out, it's like, 
it's almost, I mean, you, you just de-risk it so much for somebody versus I'm putting my money in the stock market. I'm rolling the dice, you know, hopefully somebody doesn't tweet something and then the Dow drop a thousand points, you know, it's kind of like, so, so speaking of stock market and, and the Dow and all that, what is, what is your take on like financial advisors advice? Because, you know, when we get out of training, it's like the insurance salesman, the financial advisors, they circle our offices, right. like, you know, vultures, that's the prey, you know? So, and that, you know, that's all we're pitched is, you know, 401k invest with me, invest with me for 40 years. So what is your take on that, that advice? Well, you know, my, my take may not be popular in the, the world of financial advisors. And ironically, we actually have a good number of financial advisors that are part of our mastermind um, that just had never experienced any of the stuff that we're doing um, on the alternative side. But I really just think that you lose control and you pay retail prices and you pay the highest fees when you're, you know, working with, you know, most financial advisors uh, and when your money's actively in the stock market. I mean, 401ks in general are notorious for having some of the highest fees that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, most people don't even realize that you can self-direct those funds out of the stock market and invest them into alternative investments. Um, so I think people should do that pronto. So, so if, if you, let's say you got a million bucks in a 401k, okay? And you self-direct it into another account, a self-directed retirement account. Are, are you able to, uh, when, when you invest that money, let's say in real estate, okay. Um, are you able to, does the passive income from that real estate, would that flow back to the person or would that go back into the account? You can't touch it sort of thing. That's a question that I'm asked quite frequently. Yeah. So if you're inside of a qualified plan, you know, if you're inside of a 401k or an IRA, then those dollars really need to stay there until mm -hmm. you retire, in which Got case it. then you can access them. So if you want passive income, mm -hmm. like the actual cash flow, it's probably better to use dollars outside of that, but that shouldn't limit someone. So for me, what I teach, you know, my tribe is that you want to use the right dollars for the right thing. So, you know, in, in your Roth products, your solo mm -hmm. case, you know, you want to use anything that has your best return that isn't really tax advantaged, right? So mm -hmm. if you could have a huge return, kind of like Peter Thiel did, you know, with, you know, where he had, you know, a couple billion dollars, um, you want that to go in there. And then if you've got like a defined benefit plan, you know, maybe it's better to stick to um, some lending opportunities there. And if you have, you know, if you want passive income that you can spend today, then have money outside of it. But in general, I mean, you're, you're, you're out of control and at the mercy of the whims of the market. I mean, not to mention that, you know, the, the, the data shows that only 5% of financial advisors and money managers outperform the S and P 500 index over the last 15 years. So think about that. Wow. The odds are really good. And by the way, there are great advisors out there. So this is not to everyone, but only 5% of them are outperforming if you just put your money in the S&P 500 index yourself, which by the way, is the cheapest way to be in the stock market. So you have the most uh, safety, right? It's it, because it, it's not a single stock. So you've kind of got a portfolio. It's the lowest cost. And 95% of the time, it outperforms money managers and financial planners who you're paying more money to do worse. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Most people don't even understand that. Um, and I just think anytime you have the majority of your wealth in any single thing, that's pretty risky. If the majority of your wealth is in your business, that's really risky because your business could fail for reasons be outside your control. Mm -hmm. If the majority of your money's in the stock market, um, and it crashes. And at some point it will crash again. You know, the interest rates are going to keep going up. Uh, inflation, you know, is just marked at 7.5% for the month of January, the highest it's been in 40 years. Interest rates are going to go up. The stock market's going to react. Um, more money might be printed to like, you know, balance it out. But at some point in time, something's going to happen. And if you retire when it crashes, you will never have time in your lifetime to recover. And most people don't look at it like linearly. Um, there's there's a lot of manipulation in the financial services industry, and and you know really even just with the education that Wall Street has, 
uh, and the banking industry where they want your money. So they're going to do whatever they can to convince you to give it to them so that they can make money on it, whether you do or not. Right. But because of that, they're dealing with things like these average rates of return. An average rate of return is not a real return. Like they're, they're averaging out percentages over, you know, different periods of time that don't add up to the exact number that you have. That's what's dangerous. You know, if you have $100,000, so let's say that you have like a, a 50% return and then you lose 50% of your money or vice versa, you know, plus 50 minus 50, that nets out to zero, right? So that's the 0% average rate of return. But the reality is if you had $100,000 and you lost 50 of it, you're down to 50. And if you make 50% back, you're at 75,000. So you have a negative 25% loss. That's your actual return, even though the average says that you should be at break even. And most people don't do that math themselves. They don't even realize that there be that, that, that there's so much misinformation and manipulation uh, coming. And so for me, it was a real tough pill because uh, my financial statement said that my average rate of return was 7%. I should have made money over this period of time. Mm -hmm. When I added up the numbers myself of what I put in and then how much I have. So the actual dollars I put in and then what I should have, I had lost money. Hmm. And, you know, people saw that, as you know, in March, 2020, when it went down so much. And then, you know, I was listening to the Dave Ramsey show or something and that August or September. And he was like, yeah, the market's already back to what it was. But even though it's where it is, you, like you just said, you lost so much money. It's still going to take so much more to recoup that. Yeah. And you it went down 30%, 35% and it went day. back up, but you lost money. That's not a net. That's not a net even. Right. I mean, that is a money loser. And the vast majority of people in the world don't get that because that industry wants to talk in averages to smooth it out, make it feel okay. So A, you don't pull out your money. B, you give them more money. Um, to have even the majority of your assets in one place like the stock market to me is very high risk. Yep. So um, tell us a little bit more about your book before we run out of time. Sure. Yeah. So my book's called The Lifestyle Investor. And it's the subtitle is the, the 10 Commandments of Cashflow Investing for Passive Income and Financial Freedom. And it's basically my 10 criteria for why I invest the way that I do. Uh, and so I've got a bunch of unique strategies that I just share. You know, one of them is finding invisible deals off market, no competition deals. One of them is, you know, kind of creating these preferred terms and these preferred structures. Uh, you know, I, I, I get my principal back quickly. I like the velocity of money. So if I can invest in a way where I can get my money back in six months, a year, two years, and then take that same money and reinvest it somewhere else. Well, now my money is working in two different places and I still have equity in each deal. And I can do that over and over and over. Um, I, I really like to focus on cash flow. I mean, there's a ton of different ones. I like to really de-risk my deals. So if um, in a worst case scenario, something goes wrong, I'm not losing money. Um, and I'm certainly not putting myself in a position where I can lose all my money, uh, right. you know, most of the time. So like a negative situation is maybe losing some money, but not everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think to de-risk is really important. So there's a bunch of criteria and commandments and, you know, my book kind of outlines them all. And uh, for, you know, anyone in, in your network, I'm, I'm happy to even give it to them for free. Uh, if they go to lifestyleinvestorbook.com, they can get it for free, pay shipping, uh, or they can go on uh, Amazon. But, uh, you know, either way, the proceeds are going to go to Love Justice International. Awesome. And we'll put that link uh, below the video, lifestyleinvestorbook.com. Yeah. And if they're interested in any of the other things that we do, I mean, our flagship product is our mastermind. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we have a wait list right now and it's a, you know, it's not the right fit for everyone. We've got a, a pretty extensive interview process and um, a pretty detailed application, but uh, I think that's where, you know, we, we have raving fans in that space uh, that, you know, just love the deal flow and love the camaraderie of having a like-minded community around lifestyle and, uh, buying your time back and, you know, getting good returns in a very protected environment. Uh, so you can find out more about that at justindonald.com. Uh, I also have a blog that's free, a podcast, 
a um, couple master classes. We just rolled out a mobile home park investing master class uh, last week. Awesome. I've got a passive income master class, and I've got an online course. You're a busy guy. Yeah, well, it's it's fun to just kind of uh, take content that I'm passionate about that I actively see um, changing people's lives. You know, we we had uh, om- almost 20 people last year move from some sort of a, uh, a, a job or business that kind of owned them to being financially free last year. Wow. Um, and so that to me is like the greatest uh, motivation is seeing others. I mean, when I did it, it, it felt really good, but you know, it's been a while. And um, to me, it never felt as good as it feels seeing someone else experience it. Gotcha. Well, Justin, uh, thank you again for your time and keep up the great work because what, what you're doing, is, as, as you mentioned previously, it's just, it's a, it's a life-changing thing, you know, to, to take somebody from where they are to not having to worry about working and if they want to. So thanks for all you do. Well, thank you. I appreciate uh, chatting with you about all this stuff that we're doing. And, you know, I just, I love what you're doing and the education that you're giving the medical community uh, around, you know, sharpening the the sword with finances and how to invest. I think it's incredible. And, you know, we've got a bunch of, of, you know, doctors in various different industries in our mastermind. And you can just tell that this is totally foreign And so I just commend anyone and everyone in your network listening to you for taking action and and choosing to educate yourself on the thing that's not your expertise so that you can have a better lifestyle and more opportunities and more freedom. So thanks for all that you do as well. Yes, sir.